Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame backstage with Steve Cropper. So Steve, we were talking about green onions. Right. Well, uh, you know, green onions in the studio was an afterthought with no title or anything. So uh, this was on a Sunday. And uh, on a Tuesday, no, on a Monday morning, I go down to my friend at WLOK, a disc jockey that had drive time. And uh, I said, we cut a little something yesterday. I think it's got, you know, potential of being a good record because I know it had a dance beat to it. And he played it and he backed it up. I said, what's the matter? You don't like it? He said, no, I just want to hear it again. What he did, he put it out on the air. <laughs> Untitled and all, and the phones lit up. Who is that? What is that? Where can I buy it? What can I do? So uh, <laughs> I didn't know, and I thought, this is kind of strange. Anyway, I get back to the record shop, and uh, Mrs. Axon says, what have you done? It must be your fault. And I'm going, what are you talking about? <laughs> she said, because people are calling and said they heard something on, WD, on WLOK today. And they want to know who it is and where they can buy it. And we don't know what they're talking about. And I said, are you talking about this? She called Jim Stewart, who still at that time worked at the bank. She told him what, what went on and all that. And he said, well, get the band in. Let's just come up with something on this. So he has, you know, the whole band back there, Booker and Alan, Louie and myself. And uh, we listened to it. And said, yeah. So uh, he said, we got to have a title for this. So Louie says, i got a great idea for a title. And I said, what's that? And he said, onions. So why would you want to call it onions? Just because that's the stankingest music I've ever heard. <laughs> and so I immediately said, "Well, onions are kind of negative. Sometimes it makes people cry, you know. And uh, some people get indigestion from eating onions. But green onions is a different situation. Doesn't make anybody cry. And they're always on everybody's dinner plate. They, at least where I grew up, they were. It was green onions. And I said, "That's a good idea. Let's call it green onions." You said you got a hit record, and Booker comes in and makes an announcement that he's... We have basically, you could say, the number one record in the world because it was number one on every, every chart in the United States and then it went up on the British charts and everybody else was playing it. And he announced that he was going off to college. And I went, man, we got the number one record in the world. You got to go to college. So I was going to the University of Memphis or Memphis State at the time. And uh, I just quit. And then I got to thinking one time, because I always thought a little negative about Booker taking off. Whenever we had the biggest record of all time right there, and uh, nobody knew then that it was going to last forever. But I got to thinking one night, I said, you know, had Booker not gone off to college, there'd never been an Isaac Hayes, because he was a replacement keyboard player. That's the thing. That's that, how that all started. That, that killed me when you said that. You know, <laughs> you're, so basically, if I remember right, you said, what are we going to do? With Booker's Booker gone. gone and then you said the next kid that walks in the, the studio was Isaac Hayes. I mean, what something kinda, like that. What's in the water in Memphis, you know? I have no idea. It's, uh, something's in the water, I guess, or in the air. I don't know. Time is tight. That was, oh. that was, a, that was a great dun, 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 record. Dun, dun, and and, and my, my band also covered that song. I mean, that was a, you know, yeah, you had these great out. break songs back then, like The Horse and... You know, and Time is Tight and Green Onions, they were all great instrumentals. It's just hard as heck to get a hit. It's almost impossible to get an instrumental hit. I was telling a, a friend of ours a while ago that people ask me all the time, how did you make it? Because most musicians, nothing wrong with the way they think, but most musicians think that talent is the only thing that gets you stardom as a musician. It's business. So the way you get an instrumental hit, you got to get disc jockeys to play it. Mm -hmm. And people will buy it. If they don't hear it, how would they know? They don't know. Right. But if they hear it on their local radio station, they, that, that's the thing we say about today's music. All the disc jockeys are gone. Yeah. There's still radio, there's still music, but there's no disc jockeys. And there's nobody to flip an A-side to a B-side when the producer <laughs> or the band makes a mistake. And how many times did they pick the wrong A-side, you know? Uh, several. Yeah. But another thing that that used to make B-sides popular, they would wear out an A-side until they just wore it out. They'd been playing it so long, waiting for the artist to come out with a new record. When the artist didn't come out with one right away, they'd just flip it over and start playing the B-side. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of songs that were hits because they flipped it over and played the B-side. They weren't meant to be hits, but they got played. So that just proves my theory that if you get it played and people like it, it'll sell. Okay, but. That's easier said. How did you how did you get them to play? It? I don't know. I used to spend I used to spend most of my time at radio stations. 
Well, you also spent some time writing some songs. Well, a little bit. <laughs> um, some great songs. Um, I, I know the story. I think a lot of people would like to hear it that maybe hadn't heard you tell it before, but you're talking about how you just reverse the pattern on some chords and make another hit song out of it. Well, I, I tell that live, and it's a true story. Um, a very simple you know, intro was to the song In the Midnight Hour. So uh, I'm riding with Eddie Floyd at the Lorraine Motel one night. And uh, I walk in, he says, I got a great idea for, for a hit. And I said, what? He said, I want to write a song about superstitions. Great idea. But we went through the gambit of superstitions, from black cats to umbrellas to you know champagne glasses and salt over the shoulder and all that kind of stuff. And nothing seemed to, to spark any melody of anything. And uh, after we'd exhausted it for a couple of hours, I looked at Eddie and I said, Eddie, what do people do for good luck? And he said, well, they kind of, I said, there's our song right there. So we knew we finished that song. You know, I don't want to lose this good thing. You, you want to knock on wood for good luck that you don't lose this great woman that you found or that you're dating or whatever. And we finished it. We knew we had a hit. We knew it. We, when I say a hit, we knew we had something that was recordable that could be released as a single. But I could not come up with an intro. Seriously. And I was known in those days as the intro guy because I'd come up with a lot of intros. And I just was exhausted with it. And finally I looked at Eddie and I said, I wonder what in the midnight hour would sound like backwards. He said, I don't know, play it. So I did. I just followed the dots down on midnight hour and followed them back up on knock on wood. Which you also wrote, just in case he made didn't know that. <laughs> wrote them both. And uh, that's it. Just follow the dots. People ask me how you learn how to play guitar. Follow the dots. <laughs> Another part of that story I thought was cool. Now, you guys, we know all the tragedy that happened at the Lorraine Hotel, you know, but it wasn't all bad. I mean, you guys would go rent a room at the Lorraine and write, and write songs, right? Yeah. And you wrote, didn't you write Knock on Wood at the Lorraine? Right. And what was going on during that? Well, uh... What did you say? Was it a thunderstorm? Was, or? Yeah, that's where the light lightning like thunder, like lightning. So that the like well, she thunder. She loves me as right, and I think I better. Because Eddie was like, yeah, afraid very, of the thunderstorm, right? Yeah. I don't know that you could even imagine the impact that it had on your life, but when you're doing Soul Man, and he's and was it Sam? Said, Sam said it. Yeah. Sam, play, play it, Steve. Have you ever thought what that how things may be better, different, or worse if he had not said that? Well, it was good that he did. He's probably not very happy that he said it, but anyway, he did anyway. And uh, he only said it that one time. And I, I don't even remember how many takes we did. About third or fourth take, he did it. And that's, he did it in that take and that take only, and we kept it. And then it kind of became Except part the of right the one, part of the deal. Yeah, which is mm -hmm. part of the fusion of the the stacks phenomenon. Phenomenal, great, iconic record, iconic guitar riffs that you came up with there. Um, I remember as a kid, I. I uh, and I think I've told you this before. I remember seeing the Stax logo going around and me pressing it down to <laughs> slow it down so I could pick up that slide that you were doing there, tried to. Yeah. And uh, I just how in, important that music was to all of us. But um, then, you know, you think that the songs had a longevity that's unbelievable, and then all of a sudden you got the Blues Brothers. I mean, in brief, how did that come about, and how did you? How did they let well, you know? Well, you know, there again, just being in the right place at the right time, being lucky. Yep. I got a phone call from John Belushi, and he was in New York. You didn't know him at all. No, I had met him. He didn't know me, but I had met him. I met him at a Paul McCartney party. So, what had a bigger impact, uh, or was the original Soul Man or the Blues Brothers? Well, I don't know. On your life, all probably the original, I would think. And uh, I had the idea because what they wanted to do probably would have made it anyway. I don't know. But it was basically all slow, kind of medium tempo blues song. So at the end of the rehearsal one day, I said, John, why don't you do something you can dance to? And he goes, like what? And I said, well, like Sam and Dave. He said, well, I don't know any of their songs. And I looked at Paul Schaefer and I said, you remember Soul Man? And I just hit it. And they started dancing, going crazy and singing. So when they get through with it, everybody's laughing and having a big time because Dan Ackroyd comes out there doing his crazy leg stuff. And uh, 
So he turns around to me, John does, he says, Steve, I love that song, but it's too high for me. I can't sing. I just dropped it down. And I've been, we've been playing it there ever since. So, gee, man, I hate to, it's not a bummer here, but, um, so, Otis, I mean, um, you know, I, I can't imagine what that must have been like to hear that, that Otis had, well, had gone, you know. I can, I can tell you something that it might be that you can relate to that's physical. He is the only singer that I ever had to open their mouth and say something that made the hair on my arm stand up. When yeah. he did these arms yeah. of mine, let's hold it. You don't like it? I said, I love it. I'll be right back. I said, I ran up to the control room. I said, Jim, get out here. You got to hear this guy sing. He'd been after us all day long. We were there cutting the band he'd worked with, Johnny Jenkins and the Pine Toppers. What happened with that was they had a hit song, you may remember this, called Love Twist. They could not get a follow-up. And that is one of the hardest things in the world to do. Once you have a hit trying to come up with something else that's also a hit, seldom ever do they better themselves, but they do. Some, some people come up with hits and others just live on one song. So he was just a singer in that band and he wanted us to hear him sing. And so Al Jackson told him during the session, stop bugging us. And I've already talked to Cropper. He only holds auditions on Saturday. And this was like a Tuesday or Wednesday. I said, or Al told him, he said, you probably won't get to sing for Steve. So after the session that day, and Jim says, well, why don't we end it here and then everybody go home and so we'll come back tomorrow and try again. So Al comes to me and he said, you know that guy's been bugging me all day long I ask you about? And I said, yeah. He said, could you take just 10 seconds and listen to him to get him off my back? Because he just kept bugging him. You got to hear me sing, got to hear me sing. Well, Otis, I guess, knew how good he was or whatever and wanted us to hear him. And that's, I told you the rest of it in front of me. Yeah. Come, tell him to come down to piano. And I said, okay, play something. He went, I don't play piano. I play a little guitar. He says, a little guitar. I don't play piano. He said, can you give me some of them church quads? And I don't play piano either. I said, you mean like this? I was just doing uh, six, eight triplets. And he started singing, these arms of mine. That was it. That was it. And I ran up and I stopped him. I ran up and got Jim. I said, come here. So we started playing it. Jim started getting the band together. And Duck reminded me. He said, you came out on the sidewalk yelling. And he said, get your bass back out. We got to cut something real quick. And we cut these arms of mine. Unbelievable. And the next morning, instead of cutting Johnny Jenkins, now Johnny played on it. And I played piano on it. And Johnny played guitar on it. The next morning, we're cutting a B-side for These Arms of Mine. Because you knew. <laughs> well, Jim knew and I knew that that was a single. Yeah. It was a good song. So, you know, he, he, he goes up with the Barkays. They go to, I guess, Cleveland. Yeah. Well, and the thing that I look back on that I relate to, he did die young, 26 years old when he passed away. But think about how much stuff we recorded between 63 and 66. He was 26 years old. Yes. I'm, I'm, I didn't even know. I knew, I, I knew Otis. Never had to, never had any private pictures taken with him. I'd hang out with him a little bit. We usually were writing all the time. I remember talking to Duck, and Duck was devastated. Oh, you, absolutely. You know, we all I mean, were. I know you were, yeah. But the Barquets had barred Duck's base. Yeah. And it was in the plane. That went down and he said they called him and they said we've got your base you know they pulled it up and duck said i was i was just too i was just too freaked out to, to even want it back he said i don't know i don't know what happened to it i don't, I don't know where it is and then they, this was the year that we inducted you guys mm. he said i wish i had it now but he said at the time Didn't it was it, it was just yeah. too much to handle yeah. Well, Steve, as always, right, man. man, I wish you we could do you. another hour or two, but um, I appreciate you taking time. I know yeah, you did absolutely. an interview before you came here, and you probably got one you're going to, but uh, thank you so much for everything. And, My pleasure. And uh, it's been, Anytime. been fun. Thank you. Uh, stay tuned. Come back next week, and uh, we'll have another great show on Musicians Hall of Fame backstage.